everyone. I hope that we are doing well. Um, my chat box is acting a little bit funny today. It seems like I can't access it. Um, I hope that you have access to the chat. Oh, look it! Okay, everyone's here. Perfect. Hi, everybody. I wasn't seeing your guys' chat until I made it pop out for some reason. Oh, look it. Yes. All right. So last week we talked about getting a butterfly or moth in here that had hair on its eyes. That was the uh, that was the request because we had talked about how honeybees have hair all over their compound eyes, right? Um, so I did go through my collection and unfortunately I have not collected a butterfly or a moth yet that um, has that feature that has the hairs coming out from around and in its compound eyes kind of like honeybees do um, so I picked out some different butterflies for you because I figured that's what we were asking for. We might as well kind of go with a different um, butterfly. But this one right here, the Lycaenid, they have some pretty cool characteristics on their head outside of just... Um, so they don't have hairs on coming out of their eyes, but they do have, like, raccoon eyes. I always think of them kind of like a raccoon because... The, um, the outside ring around their eyes is white, so it makes them look like they're wearing a mask. Um, they also have um, striped antenna, which I always think is really cool, and that's characteristic for the family. So all butterflies in this family, Lycenity, are going to have these kind of striped antenna, which is really fun too. So, yay! I'm happy everybody is here. Um, looks like we're calling in from Los Angeles. And if anyone else wants to shout out their location. Alright, so this butterfly that we're looking at right here, I'm going to go ahead and give us some, um, some quick facts about it. This butterfly was collected in, I believe, Lansing... Nope, New Boston. Look at that. All right. This little butterfly was collected in where I grew up. And it was actually, I, I guess I actually spread this butterfly before I graduated high school. So I think I did a pretty good job on this one. I collected it back in 2008. Um, now, it's called an Eastern Tailed Blue. So I'll give you... That's its common name, is the Eastern Tailed Blue. And then it does have the scientific name. The scientific name is Cupidocornitis. Cupido. I wonder if it's because Comintus. I'll give you guys that spelling, too. All right. So, doop, 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 doop. All right, so that is the species um, for the specimen that we're sketching here today. So I'm going to go ahead and give our names up here. Um, the Eastern Tailed Blue. And then the scientific name. A lot of times I put it in parentheses. Cupido comentis. So I bet you anything that this butterfly is named after Cupid, which I kind of love. All right. I haven't seen... Oh, look at that! Okay, I haven't been seeing everybody's chat, and that's because YouTube decided that it was only going to show me the top chat and not live chat. All right. Oh my OMG, you got me a hair streak. 
Yes, it's a blue, Susan. Yeah. All right, that's still awesome. Okay, I can read everyone's chats now. I'm much happier. Um, yeah, so with butterflies, a lot of times our identification of the butterfly is not using leg features like we do in beetles and ants and other things. So a lot of times in butterflies, we have to rely on the coloration, um, but also very much the wing venation on the front wing and the hind wing. Um, so... Uh, if you really don't know what a butterfly or moth is, and you don't know even where to start, like even what family it's in, um, the suggestion would be to actually wipe off some of the butterfly's scales and get rid of the coloration, because you're going to have an easier time identifying something to family with just the wing venation of the butterflies rather than the colorations. Yes, Susan, it is an eastern tailed blue. Yes, we can get a zoomed out full body shot for sure. So, um, what's under the microscope is as far out as I can zoom, but I can go ahead and put our specimen under this camera and I can even get it a little bit closer for us. Let's see. All right, so that's what we're going to get for for a dorsal view. Um, and then I can go ahead and give us our measurements before we get started sketching. Um, if we want to go, I'm going to go... Uh, the measurement of its wing spread first. So you guys can see under the camera how I'm measuring. Um... And let's see, we'll go from the top to the top. It looks like with its wings spread, its wingspan is about 2.8 2 centimeters. Um, so its wingspan looks like it's about 2.8 centimeters, and if you wanted to give it the length from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, it is approximately one centimeter. Um, so those are our measurements in both directions. Now, um, eastern-tailed blues not only have characteristics on the, the top or the inside of the wings, but if we flip our specimen over, it has also coloration and... Um, it also has coloration and like designs and patterns on the outside of the wings too. So it's kind of fun to be able to both show the inside and the outside when we're sketching and we will flip my specimen over under the microscope so that we can see that. Perfect. All right, so um, the other the other couple of scientific names that we didn't really talk about, Lysenid. This is the family of our of our butterfly today, um, and the common name for all of these butterflies in this family, the Lysenids, are the gossamer winged. They're the gossamer winged butterflies. And I'm not sure exactly where they get that common name, um, but I, uh, I figured I would throw that one at you too. So we're looking at Cupido, and I believe that he's, this is guy's gotta be named after Cupid, which is kind of fun. All right. Um, I think on my sketch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give myself a light overview and then I'm going to do the top side of the, um, I'm going to do the, the, I guess the inside of the wings on the left and then the outside of the wings on the right, um, so that we can see kind of both sides of our specimen and both sides of our, our friend here. All right, so I'm going to give myself this quick light outline. 
give myself kind of a little head, kind of like this half half circle head. Imagine a thorax that gets a little bit wider because it's got all of those muscles in it, and then an abdomen that comes down to a point. Um, I'm going to warn you guys pre, kind of like ahead of time, I am not really a lepidopterist. I don't have, um, uh, I may not be able to answer every single one of your questions. I will try the best of my ability to answer as many as possible. Um, uh, but sometimes, sometimes butterflies trick me. All right. And then our overall wing shape. Our overall wing shape of our butterfly here, um, it comes, it has this very triangular shape where it comes almost up to a rounded tip and then it comes down. Um, one way you can tell a butterfly is properly mounted or properly spread, we want to see the, um, the back side of the front wings. So if I've got my front wings taken care of and I've got the corner, all right. Um, we want to see on a butterfly spread the back side of this front pair of wings make a 90 degree angle with the body. So that's our goal. If any of you ever get into actually collecting and spreading butterflies, when you spread a butterfly or a moth, a lot of people don't, don't pull up the hind wings enough. They kind of leave them sagging or low. Um, I've actually got a specimen over here. Um, this is another, this is a moth that I spread, um, back in, like, junior high. So, you can see how the, um, how the, uh, back side of the front wing is kind of moving down. We don't have a straight line all the way across. You see that angle falls down. Um, and it's really difficult to remount a butterfly or a moth. So this one is actually pretty good because it, as we're zoomed out as far as we can, we want this line to be completely straight across. It's pretty good. At least better than the other one, huh? All right. And when we zoom in, we're going to actually be able to see some of these little tails at the on the hind wing. Um, we can't see them just yet, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of finish the overall shape of our wings and then move into a zoomed in so that we can see what we're doing here. Marley, I'm so sorry. I... I went through my entire collection, and I couldn't find a butterfly or a moth with hairy eyeballs. And I know that that was our suggestion, but what I did find was a butterfly that has cool characteristics on its head. Um, and funny enough, I must have glued these antenna back on. Light. So, um, we're zoomed in and looking at the top of the head, and then we will turn our specimen sideways and we'll look at, at how the mouth parts work. But if we are just sketching a dorsal image of our head, um, these are the characteristics that we want to see. Oh, I know! Don't leave, Marley! We want you here! You're our friend! <laughs> Alright, um, when we're looking at our head, I'm going to go ahead and start solidifying some of these lines. Um, one of our defining characteristics, one of our defining characteristics for butterflies in this family, Lycenidae, are those, um, are those white seedy or those white hairs around the eyes. Um, you can see how there's kind of that white line and it gives them kind of what looks like a raccoon eyeball. Those are actually a, um, a defining characteristic. So if you see that on a butterfly or a moth, you know that they're in that Lycenid family. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. And we do call them, we call them scales, right? Okay. 
So I'm going to go ahead and give my lady an eye. And the eyes do make this kind of L shape in the head. And we've got some cross hatching in here to make them look good. All right. And then I do have that darker hair. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to color this darker hair in so that that so that those white CD that circle the eyes are more evident. All right. And then in between in between our eyes up here, we're going to have two long antenna now, butterfly antenna are long with knobs at the end, whereas uh, moth antenna are, um, are bipectinate. They look like feathers. So, let's go and look at the antenna that are fun because they're stripey. All right, look at those long stripey antenna. Those are the second characteristic of lysenids. And I gotta tell you, when I was in, um, when I was taking class and learning about the families of butterflies, this the lysenids were my favorite um, because of how easy they were to tell apart from everybody else. You see those raccoon eyes and those striped antenna, and you know it's a lysenid. Um, Susan asked, is the fur on the body basically the same thing as the scales on the wings? Um, just long and sticky outy, or are they different structures? So we're going to have two kind of different structures here. We do have long hair, hair-like CD, um, and those are going to be kind of more fluffy. They're going to kind of hold on to pollen, that type of stuff. Um, but those uh, scales that were around the eyes, those are flat and plate-like. So those are more like the scales on the wings. So if we're imagining kind of, if we're zooming in, if we zoom in to these scales on this wing, let's see, we've got that compound eye I'm going to add in here on the edge. And then our scales look... kind of like this where they shingle on top of each other and then um, let's go ahead and zoom in and check on check on one thing really quick yeah that's what I thought all right so you can see right about here that looks like those that um, those black hairs that are longer and thin, they look more like hair than these plates really do up here. All right. And so those have two different structures. Um, so when I'm sketching, I actually have these white ones that are flat and plate-like, but then you do have these long, darker hairs up in the front near its head. All right, so that's kind of cool because you've got both the hair structures right there. And I'm going to go ahead and continue with this antenna right here. So when I'm looking at my butterfly, at my Lysenid's antenna, we do see that club, but it's not like a super knobby club. Sometimes butterflies, the club on the end of their antenna is very distinct. This just kind of expands towards the end. Rather than an antenna that would normally kind of shrink and go pointed towards the end, this butterfly has an antenna that once it gets kind of to the end, it expands just a little bit and then goes back to being nice and thin. And I'm gonna go ahead and give them the, give it the stripies. But then once it gets to the knob, the knob is all, is completely dark. It doesn't have any stripes. Oh, I forgot to turn my camera back on. Here you go. 
All right. Um, I'll go ahead and do the other one because you guys missed that one. So I'm going to go ahead and give my antenna. And I want to just make sure that the end of this antenna stays gets a little bit wider. So I'll actually start from the end and make it nice and wide. And then I'll go and make it thin and pull it all the way to the end. And then give it the stripes. Alrighty, um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to be sketching my inside on the left right here. So I'm just going to go right here and right inside. Okay. I'm going to go and zoom in. Oh, I guess there's one other thing on the head that we could look at um, before we scoot over to the wing. <sighs> Oh, yes, Little Bee's Little World. Um, that is because those antenna, when I, I didn't notice until after we started the live stream and I zoomed in on it, those antenna are not glued to where they belong. Those antenna felt, well, the right one is correct. All right, so... Um, you see right here, <laughs> I was tricky. This specimen is something like 13 years old. It must have lost, lost its left antenna at some point. So I glued it back on and I must have missed where it was going. But this right antenna, this is where it belongs. So that antenna is coming out right at kind of where the top of the D of the antenna comes out of. So if I was going to look really close up at my sketch, the antenna would actually be coming, the antenna would be coming right here at this corner on both sides. My right one is a little bit off. Yeah. Right here and here. <clears throat> Does the knob have a different color? Um, let's check. It looked mostly like this knob was just, uh, yeah, the knob is kind of this brown color that most of the, most of the butterfly is. I'm gonna go ahead and change what it's mounted on. Maybe we'll receive a little bit more light. Yeah. Oh, my microscope said too much light. I'm going to change it up on you. Come on, bud. We gave you more light and you just made it darker. Yeah, so the tips of the antenna are the same kind of dark brown that the rest of the, uh, like where you see the dark brown coming out from underneath the blue scales, that's going to be kind of the same color as the antenna. I can go ahead and zoom in. To our antenna really quick, just in case you wanted to see. I guess this in some places it reflects a little bit of orange. Oh, Marley, butterflies are beautiful. We've done so many hymenopteran with you. But I guess if you want to if you want to get particular, let's if we zoom in on some of these wing scales, they're pretty nifty. Um so let's see. A lot of times the butterfly's wing scales, you can see them here. Um they look like shingles. And when the sun or the light hits them, they're actually used to disperse um, to disperse the heat. And so they have this like a thermoregulation function for the butterflies. Do any Lysenids mimic wasps? Most Lysenids are blue. <laughs> um, 
I can't think of any Lycenids that mimic wasps. There are clear wing moths, the Ciceids, those will mimic wasps sometimes. All right, so um, here's our front wing. I figure we can leave it here for a minute as we're sketching. Uh, don't mind the couple of puncture holes that were used to spread this butterfly. Um, now, when we are looking at when we're looking at our butterfly's wing, I'm gonna look at right here the angle at which it comes off of the body. So, um, if I'm looking at this is my thorax or where both of the wings are connecting right the front and the hind wing connect to the thorax um i'm gonna make sure that this angle right here in the corner comes out and then up a little bit right um to give it this angle and then when it's coming down it doesn't come straight down it does go out just a little bit which might be where they get their gossamer winged name Alrighty, and then when we're looking at butterfly wings, a lot of times um, you see this guy up here on the top, other than being this kind of metallic blue brown color, uh, doesn't have doesn't have a lot of fun features. But what we can draw draw is sketch the wing venation of our butterfly. Just trying to find it in this lady right here. Nope, she doesn't. Yes, she does. There it is. Okay, so our butterfly, she has a coastal vein that's coming up like this, and then she has. A lot of times butterflies are going to have this kind of long loop in their wings and that um, you can see the bottom of it right here and then it comes up to about here and then moves back down. Um, and this is going to be a little box that a lot of times lepidopterists are going to use to see how many veins are coming off of the middle, how many veins are coming off of the bottom, and where are they coming off of. And that's how we identify a lot of other butterflies and moths. And if we get into doing lots of butterflies and moths, we will spend more time on really focusing in on wing venation because that's really where you got to go for um, higher level ID of these guys. Um, but what we can do is give, I believe she's got one up here off of the top, and then one off of the bottom, and then two more. And then um, any veins that are south or further down from this C right here, these are what we would call the anal veins. And I think that there's just the one down there. That's the one that I can see. Vampiric stained glass windows. I kind of like that. Hair streaks mimic jumping spiders. You know, I've never heard that before, but I would believe it. With the little tails kind of moving in the wind, I bet you that could look like a jumping spider dancing, but why would a butterfly want to mimic a jumping spider? That's my question back. So... Yes, this butterfly is blue. Um, it has faded just a little bit, but I promise when it was collected, it was a pretty bright, bright blue. You can still see the blue in some places, in particular at the bases of the wings. Um, that's where we can see the blue the most. And when we flip it over, we're going to be able to see like the cloudy blue or the sky blue color that um, the other side of the wing is. If I was a 
lepidopterist, I could tell you which, if this was a male or a female. I'm not sure. Sorry, guys. Okay, so, um, we're looking at our hind wing now. Well, I mean, I feel like if you had a ma a butterfly, right, an eastern-tailed blue, that was mimicking a spider, especially if it was doing that spider's, like, mating dance, you would think that the spider would then jump towards the butterfly, which is not what the butterfly would want to happen. So that's where I'm coming from, is, like, there isn't really a good reason to do this. All right. So our hind wing um, comes out, it gives a little bit of space to the front wing. So I'm going to cut it in just a little bit more before it comes out. And then our hind wing also has this, it comes down and out. And then our little itty bitty attempting to be a tail is right here. You see how it, you know, there's this little poke that comes out? That is uh, one of our little tails, or what's trying to be a tail. I think it's better on the other side. I'll show you. Yeah. Let's look at this side for this butterfly. That Those colors are better, too. It's just that this wing is a little bit angled. That's why I was showing the other side. Look at, okay, see that little itty bitty tail? That's why this butterfly is called the Eastern Tail Blue. And because it's normally a little blue metallic butterfly. For focus, I prefer this side. And we can see more of the wing. But you can see the left side and the right side, they do have different length tails, which is also interesting. I wonder if this one broke a little bit or if there's just some natural variation be between left and right side. I'm pretty sure the orange spots on the upper side only show up on the females in this species. Thank you, Susan! So, because we can see the orange spots on this side, Susan is sharing with us that this is a lady. Are you assuming they would might want to mimic a jumping spider to scare other things away? Is that our argument? Trying to get the outer shape of this wing taken care of. Yeah, it's possible that the tails just broke off. But, I don't know, the tails, like, the hair around the tails looks pretty even. I guess we should, I guess I'll go ahead and I'll zoom in on the tails just to see. Lily B guy. Lily B tail. And then... My issue is that it's coming down and I need it to angle up better. I think I need to cut this corner off. That's looking better. Okay. Took me a minute to get the uh, wing shape of this hind wing taken care of while I was while I was chatting with you with my friends here. All right, so the other thing is we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at our hind wing venation. Um, so we can see that we've got this one here that branches in two, so we can go ahead and set that one. Uh, 
And then we have one more that comes down here and it extends out. But it also, there's going to be a cross vein right here that is a little bit more difficult to see because we are creating another one of these boxes, one of these kind of Ds. So if I come down here and kind of push it off a little bit like this, what I'm going to do is come back up to where my Y is and give there, make a cross vein there. And then from that cross vein in between the middle, I get one more that goes out and then a second one coming off of the bottom. Okay, and then something like that. So that's what our wing venation is gonna look like on the top. And then obviously our spots are going to occur in between these veins. So you can see kind of, um, I think this one needs to come up just a little bit to make it, well, a lot of it to make it more even. But the eye spots are going to occur in these spaces here. Trying to make those even across. I mean, there are jumping spiders who mimic ants. That's true. I actually just sketched with kids this week a um, an assassin bug that mimics ants. That was fun. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move our our specimen really quick. And I'm looking down here at the abdomen, nice and thin. And look at that. Oh wait, we said female, right? All right, I would have to flip it over. <clears throat> All right, so we've got a nice long thin abdomen and we're gonna be flipping our specimen over to see the other side. And uh, the abdomens are normally a lot more plump and happy looking, right? This specimen has been a specimen since 2008, so it's a little bit tired. All right, it does have a pretty thick set of um, hairs or CD at the end of its abdomen too. Um, that's what I was zooming in to check out to look at. All right, take off these labels. I heard color of the wing in this species is based on season and the area it resides, that's why they've been mistaken for azure blues. They're very, azure blues and the eastern tail are also very, very similar. Um, the, uh, the big difference between the two, or at least the big specimens, the specimens that I was looking at, <clears throat> the eastern tail blue has these very prominent two or three orange spots right here on the hind wing when they have their wings closed. Um, but the other, the spring is your, Right, that's him. The spring is your has um, has more of these orange orange spots. They have different orange patterns on their hind wings, and so when we're out in the field and we're trying to identify these specimens, obviously you are not going to be spending time counting wing venation or looking this close because the specimen's going to be flying by. So the characteristics that you're going to use a lot of times are um, characteristics that you can see quickly as it is moving. And one of those characteristics are these 
two orange spots with the tail, that's going to be um, something that if you see, it's like, oh, that's probably an eastern tail blue, especially if you see it fly away and it's metallic blue, right? Um, so we're looking for a blue to blue-gray butterfly that has these two or three orange spots on the hind wing with this little tail. Um, and then if you remember, uh, the characteristic for the family is all on the head, in the antenna and the eyes, and that is a characteristic that you can see as the butterfly is flying. If you're looking at it well enough, if you're looking at it super close and, and um, watching it as it flies, um, the white striping on the antenna is obvious because even as it's flying through the air, you can see it. It kind of looks funny because the white almost disappears into whatever background you're looking at and the black is there. And so it'll look like the antenna is kind of like speckled across the air. It's kind of funny. Um, but that is an obvious characteristic that you can see. They don't have the orange at all in your area. You know, there might be a different species in your area, too. So, um, let's see. We've got... There are lots and lots of tailed blues. Um, so if it's blue and it's got a tail, it's going to be in the same genus, Cupido. Um, but then it's going to have many... There are many, many, many different species. Um, this species here, Cupido comintus, the eastern tailed blue, I believe always has those couple orange spots on the, those two to three orange spots on the hind wing, even if it's very, very light. I'm um, cross-referencing some pictures on iNaturalist just to make sure, and I'm, that's what I'm seeing. Oh no, wait. Let's see. Oh man, I got I got lost in the chat. You guys were so quick. Um These tails are quite a bit longer. Based on the season. What about a fly that has ant shapes and its wings to deter predators? Oh, that's cool, little bee. A fly that has an ant shape in its wing. I think I've seen that, but I forgot what it is, what, what family of fly that is. Yeah, so there are a variety of azures. There are a variety of um, little blue butterflies, right? Um, a lot of tailed blues. And uh, depending on the species, you're going to see a variation of colorations. Okay. Check out this front wing. All right, so this time, instead of spending my time worrying about the wing venation, I'm gonna go ahead and sketch the coloration or the um, or the the uh, colors, the shapes that we're seeing, because those are gonna be the characteristics that we see out in nature, out in wild, when we are IDing these guys. So they've got this series of darker spots that kind of gets larger as it gets further down. Let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And they look kind of like parentheses at the end. And there is variation in these, and there's going to be variation in them in the wild too. We also have these three kind of V shapes. And that's a lot of the coloration in our front wing. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of make this go ahead and get it all solid. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and sketch my hind wing. And the hind wing is going to come out kind of where these um, parentheses do. And I'm going to go ahead and give, try and give it
something like that. All right, so I've got my hind wing taken care of, and the right side was way easier than the left side to get figured out. Maybe it was because I did it before. That's possible. All right, so I'm gonna come in here and give some of these darker spots a try. This kind of looks like a question mark to me in its wings. If you start here and you come this way, and then you've got a dot. So these kind of remind me of a question mark. is our is our um is what we're going to work around for our spots down here so we've got the dark and then we've got some nice orange and one of these days i will bring color <laughs> i've been saying that i know So Marley, I will admit, I do prefer sketching hymenopteran and beetles over butterflies. I think that a lot of times with butterflies, we're looking at colors and, um, and because it's a little bit more difficult for me, because I'm, I sketch black and white, I do line drawings with you guys. Um, but I know that so many of us want to see butterflies and talk about butterflies. I figure we might as well try a couple times. So that's what our wing's going to look like on one side. Um, we make sure we've got that tail, that it's metallic blue. Um, we do have nice, long, kind of white hair along the insides of the wings. Um, we could go ahead and zoom in on that to see what it looks like. It kind of, it looks super fluffy from here. Look at that. All right, so this is kind of cool. Our butterfly not only... All right, I think we've got enough light to zoom in further. Look at that. All right, so our butterfly not only has... You can see all of those little itty-bitty segments around the edges. Those are all of our butterfly's scales, but it also has CD. And it's not only on the edges of the wings. The CD, the hair, is a little bit more difficult to see, but it covers the entire wing. Um, it's thick in this hair all the way across. which is a little more obvious when I'm looking at it under my microscope, but I promise you it's there. If I bump the focus up a little bit, you can start to see some of these lines up in this region, and that's all of that hair on top of your, um, on top of your scales for the wings. The hind wing should be in front when viewed from the bottom. Yes, true story. I um I will make sure I change that on my sketch. You make a very good point. If we are looking at our butterfly from the bottom, instead of seeing the instead of seeing the the front wing, we actually see this rounded edge of the hind wing. You make a very good point, thank you. So if I was going ahead and changing that on this front, I would take this line where it stops on my hind wing and round it up. Thank 
Thank you. Although it does kind of make my butterfly look funky. <laughs> it's like I took the same pair of wings and put it on one side and the other side. It's going to fly in circles for the rest of its life. Recently learned that birds often have dark feather tips because of the melanin is a strengthener. Does the dark color in insects come from melanin? And does it also act as a strengthener? That is a great question, and I'm not sure. Um, melanin, I believe, is a pigmented color. Yes. Yeah. So I would say yes. A lot of the darker colors is probably melanin. That's going to be a pigmented color. Um, many butterflies also use structural color, but I don't think that lysenids do. I think that lysenids are all a pigmented color. So, I love these questions, um, and I can tell you the difference between a pigmented color and, oh, I know what we can do. Hold on two seconds. I'll be right back. All right. I do not have... A blue morpho butterfly in my collection. Um, I worked at a butterfly pavilion for a long time, but as it turns out, never brought um, any of the butterflies home after they were um, passed. But what I do have is a sunset moth, and it's still on its uh, board, but I figure we can take this down together. So I'm just going to go ahead. It's definitely dry. It's not going to move at all. So I'm going to go ahead and take out some of these pins, and hopefully this isn't one of those butterflies that lost its wings. Uh -huh. All right, we're going to do the other side. It's like my favorite part of... of um, spreading is removing these wax paper because you've been looking at the specimen through wax paper for so long you forget how vibrant and beautiful they are all right come on gentle it's not there we go So this is a um this is a Madagascan sunset moth. It's not Madagascan. It is Madagascan. Yeah. Um so this is the Madagascan sunset moth. It's a day flying moth. And so it is a moth, but it has these bright, beautiful colors. It flies around in the day. I love it. And it has what we call a structural color. So those um, metallic green, metallic blue, all of these darker red, purple areas, those are going to stay those metallic, beautiful colors forever. They're never going to fade. Um, and that's because what's creating the color in... Um, on the scales, on the wings, is not a pigment. It's not melanin. This is actually small crystalline structures that uh, cover the that cover the uh, that cover the scale. So that's why it looks metallic. Because if you look at it from different angles, the light is reflecting back at different angles, creating different colors. And also why the colors that you see are close to each other on the rainbow. So a lot of times you'll see metallic green, blue, um, because those are right next to each other. And so the refraction is just a little bit different. Or these metallic red, orange down here at the base. 
Um, I do not have any quick evaporating ethanol right now to show you this trick, but if you take a little bit of ethanol that's uh, like 90%, right, so it's going to evaporate pretty quickly, so it won't damage your specimen, you can put a little droplet of ethanol on a, on a, moon mo on a sunset moth. And you'll see its true color because the pigment underneath all of those crystalline colors, it's red. You're looking at a red moth. Um, but it's not red when you take in all those crystalline structures. So if you put liquid on it, it fills in the structure and it reflects the pigment. Crazy science. All right, so if they're pigmented, give me a minute. So, oh, that's so exciting, Susan. I'm glad that you're going to be able to hang out with an apiist and, um, and chat bees. That's going to be a lot of fun. So if they're pigmented, then how are they seeing blue? Didn't scientists completely kill the concept of blue with the whole structural coloration theories? I'm not sure. We have blue flowers and blue birds. Are you saying, Avea, are you saying that, that blue in the wild is only structural? Because I think we've got blue pigment. There's got to be, there's blue pigment in the wild. There's blue pigment in the wild. I'm sure of it. And these guys, they, they fade. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so that's some kind of fun little nifty factoids about this, um, sunset moth. I can go ahead and take it off the tree. Look at it. Yay. Oh, that's funny. The green areas uh, work with the green screen. <clears throat> so you've got, I'll, I'll show it down here where you can see. Um, so if we wanted to look at the bottom side of this so that you guys can see, I love them. Ivea, I've got to believe that there is blue pigment out there. I've never heard that there wasn't. Um, does anyone want to back me up out there? I uh, yeah. Yeah, we're not we're not murdering colors. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. All right, so the only thing that we haven't really looked at super close is the mouth, especially the the ventral side of the mouth, where you can see some of the uh, mouth parts and some... Oh, got to move my... No bumping of other specimens in the process. So, those little fellas that look like horns... These guys right here that look like tusks, um, those are the adapt the butterflies adapted version of their labial palps. Um, now, <laughs> this is a call out for, let's see, um, Marley, Marley labial palps. Bees and wasps have those too, right? So we've got some connection to your favorite hymenopterans, right? Labial palps, we've seen a lot of those guys when we, when we see them on butterf when we see them on the beetles and wasps, a lot of times I call them mouth fingers because they sit right here and they help kind of 
to push ma to push food towards their mandibles and that's kind of their that's their purpose um whereas these guys i believe are here to protect the proboscis that would be my guess um we've got these nice long labial pelps they look like horns i kind of love them um and then the long um the long straw like mouth part it is spiral and it's tucked up into the head um Actually, talking about that, I do have I do have a picture of a butterfly proboscis. It's actually a moth proboscis. I took a picture of this sphinx moth proboscis because um, when it passed away, instead of tucking its mouth part into to protect it, it kind of curled outside of its outside of its natural mouth part. It gave me the opportunity to take this really cool picture. Um, so I am in the process of snagging it right now. Okay. That is the proboscis, that's the mouth part of a sphinx moth that I have here in my collection. Um, so uh, you can see that it is this long spiral, and when it opens up, this very, very, very tip of the mouth part will, um, will drink nectar. All right, yeah. I was really, really excited to take this picture. And you can see all of the individual little itty bitty tiny segments that go into this nice long proboscis. Because think about it, the exoskeleton, we talk about it all the time, the exoskeleton is hard. It's like armor. And so it doesn't have the ability to bend. So if you think of any insect that has the ability to move or bend, Wherever they're bending, there is a joint between two different pieces of exoskeleton. Well, these mouth parts can completely create this perfect spiral. So they need to have an incredible number of small little segments to help them curl it in and out. So cool. Yeah, if I, I would like to hear more. I do believe there was a there was a documentary and I think it was called The Color Blue. And that sounds like something that might have been in that documentary, but I didn't watch it. So maybe that's something that I should do because there's a documentary. It's called The Color Blue and it's all about the color blue and the environment and how we see it. Um and so I guess that's probably what you're going back to, but I haven't personally seen it yet, so I can't speak to it. So those labial palps. And because we can, we could actually see those labial palps from the dorsal view too. Um, I just didn't sketch them here. I'm going to go ahead and give my... Um, and give my butterfly these labial pelps up here in the front. Two little appendages up here. Might as well. She, she has them, so she deserves them. Alrighty, so um, my question to you is... Are we feeling good about our conversations? Do you have other bug or butterfly related questions? What do you want to draw next week? Um, let's see. I don't have any blue morphos. We could, I mean, we could draw the sunset moth, but that is a, that's a lot of color. We could put it under the microscope, though. Well, we're trying to decide what we're sketching next week. I'm going to go ahead and put my labels back on my specimen first. That's super important. 
especially because this specimen is probably one of the oldest in my collection, being from that being from that it is from 2008. Ugh. Alrighty. This is a larger moth, so we'll be able to get closer to the scales. Susan wanted a quick look at our blue butterfly's legs. I can switch over to those really quick. So, um, I have a front leg and a middle leg here to show you. They are white. Um, if we are looking right about here, this from here to here, this is going to be our femur, the first large segment. From here to here, this is the tibia. Um, this butterfly does have a tibial spur, this long kind of spine at the end of the, that marks the end of the tibia. And then these are the rest of the tarsal segments. And if we look close enough, right about here, at the very, very, very tip of our leg, that's where the two tarsal claws are. So we're talking right about here, that's our tarsal spur, where the, or that's our tibial spur, where the tibia ends. And then we've got one, Let's see, one, two, three, four, five tarsal segments, maybe? There's a lot of hair in the way. There's a lot of CT and hair in the way to see the segments for sure. Let's see, lantern flies or leaf hoppers. A gnarly beetle. What's a gnarly beetle, Marley? Like, is that a common name for a beetle, or are you just talking about, like, a wicked awesome one? Something that's, like, spiky, like a trogid. Um, we did do wheel bugs already, um, and let me check. I believe that we did wheel bugs on a Thursday. Sometimes, yeah, wheel bugs were actually the first week, um... The first session ever of live stream, we did the Cogwheel Assassin Bug. Oh, uh, I unfortunately don't have an Orchid Mantis. Gnarlicus Beetleus. Is spikus. Well, Marley, I do have a beetle that I would consider a spikus, even though that's not its actual name. Um, I really like these beetles. They're called trogid beetles, and they, um, they're called trogid beetles, and they look like little rocks. They're, they're pretty gnarly looking. Um, let me go see if I've got a picture of one. I might. N nope. I don't have a picture of a trogon just yet. Alright. Um, the other suggestion were leaf hoppers. And I do have leaf hoppers to sketch. Um, on a Sunday session, I did a session where we did frog hoppers, leaf hoppers tree hoppers and plant hoppers um so we did we had one session where we covered four different um four different families of hoppers really quick that was kind of a fun session um but because it was sunday i'd be willing to kind of redo that for you guys on thursday too can i draw can you draw legs on the butterfly yeah Sure. 
you can see the um, the legs from the ventral side. So what I can do is I'm going to go ahead and draw a vertical line down the center of my butterfly. And I'm going to say this is the top side and now this is the bottom side. And I can go ahead and draw legs on the bottom side. <laughs> We have not done dragonflies and damselflies. That could be fun. I've got a uh, I've got a jewel wing damselfly that we could definitely sketch. It's metallic green and blue, and because it's metallic and it's never gonna fade, it has a structural color. Um, but a lot of dragonflies have pigmented colors, so those kind of fade as as part of the collection, so that's kind of sad. I'm getting the focus ready so that I can sketch these legs. Do I have any aquatic moths? I wish I had an aquatic moth. You know, I even lost my caterpillar specimen. I had a specimen of an aquatic caterpillar and I was so proud of it, and I don't have it anymore. All right, so um, I've got a coxie that's going to be kind of where my leg connects to. And then I'm going to add a femur. All right, um, my femur is going to come up like this. And then I've got a tibia. Let's see. And then the tarsal segments. All right, and then I'm gonna go ahead and give, let's see, we've got another, we've got a middle leg that's gonna be a little bit longer, coming up, going down, femur, tibia, tarsal segments. And the tarsal segments are almost all, they almost look all connected, so I just gave them a single and then and then um, gave cross lines in there. Um, and then the hind leg, you can't see the hind leg on my specimen because unfortunately they broke off. A lot of times people don't ask to see butterfly legs. Fun fact. Um, so it's actually going to be connected right about here in the bottom third of my thorax. And the leg is going to move out kind of like this, kind of further down. And that's the femur. And then we've got the tibia. And then the tarsal segments. And so you can see that it's kind of longer, um, but maybe not that long. Maybe we want it. closer to that. Yeah. And then I've got all of this nice pretty long hair on the inside of my wing. And then I would go back in and erase all of these cross lines that make my legs look like they're cut into pieces. So what it sounds like, wait, there are aquatic moths? Yes, there are. Um, there are moths that are that have hydrophobic hairs. Um, we spell that like this. Hydrophobic. Hydro meaning water and phobic meaning fearing um, or pushing away, right? So um, there are certain species, there's a couple of species of moths. I believe that they are crambids and noctuids. Um, there are crambids and noctuids that are aquatic. One of them dives into the water. 
I don't remember which one. Now, um, they've got scales on their wings that are called hydrophobic. And so when they dive down into the water, um, they're actually pushing, um, they actually push the water kind of out of the way and they dive down with an air bubble that completely covers all of their wings because their wings are covered in these hydrophobic hairs. So what they end up having is a moth that has a head and a body and these long kind of wings. And this is obviously a very quick sketch. Um, so we've got a head and a body and some wings and it's diving under this under this water and it will carry an air bubble with it that completely covers its whole body and its wings other than its legs because its legs will break well its legs come out up here um its legs will break the uh will break that surface so that it can use its legs as oars to swim because its legs have these hairs on it that it can kind of use to swim. And so um, then we call, there's this little bubble right here is called a plastron. We call that a plastron. And it helps my moth, while it is swimming, breathe through diffusion. So we have a certain amount of oxygen that is in our bubble, that is in our plastron. And our plastron is swimming through a water body that also has dissolved oxygen in it. So as my insect is using the oxygen in the plastron, um, as it's taking in oxygen, it can also, um, it will also move oxygen from the water into the air bubble. And this is what allows my moths to breathe because um, this plastron can, as it's swimming through the water, can kind of pick up oxygen and push away water because, um, because those hairs are still hydrophobic. Um, the reason that they dive into the water is to lay an egg and that egg hatches and the caterpillar under the water is cool because the caterpillar looks like a little porcupine caterpillar. It just is a little caterpillar and it has what looks like spines all over it. Like a really, I hit my, hit my camera. It has spine looking things all over it. And those spines are actually, um, gills that help it breathe. They almost look like little hairs all over the thing. And what he does to protect himself and all of those hairs is he'll go out and he'll chew a circle of a leaf and he'll put it above him. And then he'll chew another circle and he'll put the other circle underneath him. And then he'll take his silk because he has silk glands up near his mouth and he will silk those two pieces of, of plant together and leave himself openings on the front and in the back so that he can go ahead and turn around and feed on any plant material he wants and still look hidden because he doesn't want to be eaten by fish. He definitely doesn't want to be eaten by fish. Most of these moths that dive down into the water to lay their eggs, they could, in theory, come back up out of the water and fly around. Most of them get eaten by fish. All right. Now that I'm done with my, my aquatic moth story, I'm going to come back to the, to the chat. Yes. Oh, the, yes, there is, um, which two of the three legs are these? This is the front pair and the hind pair. The, or the, this is the front pair and the middle pair. The hind pair, um, start here. You can kind of see that dark spot. Um, but I do not believe that the hind pair are on this specimen on either side, or I would have shown them to you. Um, you can see that coxie, this, this is where those legs should be connected, but they aren't. So, you're right, my moth is missing its hind legs. Butterfly T-Rex legs! Oh, the little short ones for the nymphalids, the brush-footed... Are you talking about brush-footed butterflies? Oh, I love that! I'd never heard of them be called T-Rex legs. That completely made my day. I definitely have brush-footed butterflies. I've got nymphalids around. Oh, man. 
<laughs> yeah. So honestly, Mar Marley made the comment about aquatic moths and snorkel bugs. Um, I have one more breathing story. Um, if we want to talk about fun abilities to breathe outside of just, you know, having butt snorkels like my water scorpions and having these aquatic moths that can literally just swim around in the water with a bubble that collects oxygen for them. Um, there is a beetle grub. Now, there aren't, well, there's a good number of aquatic beetles out there and a number of the aquatic beetles even have aquatic immatures. Now, this insect, I would say, is semi-aquatic because the adults are not aquatic, but the immatures are. Um, and they are a species of weevil. Now, don't ask me which species. I'm not exactly sure. You could look it up if you wanted. Um, it's a weevil, so that would be in the family Curculionidae. Right? No, that's mosquito. Give me a minute. Yeah, I was right. Curculionity. All right, so there is a weevil, um, and this is my little picture of a, um, this is my little picture of a lily pad, all right? So um, there's a weevil that, as an immature, it kind of looks like a, um, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have started this, we're gonna, we're gonna call them, okay. Um, there is this weevil that doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a plastron that it can breathe out of, and it doesn't have gills like a lot of other aquatic insects do. And so what they look like, they kind of look like this large maggot-looking guy. They don't really have... They've got like a little small mouth. They don't really have eyes, and they don't have legs. Um, they've got a mouth. Maybe they have a little simple eye. They're pretty much a nothing immature, right? Um, and honestly, they're feeding on the plant material. But the cool thing about them is how they breathe because they have little vampiric fangs on the backside of their abdomen. And those little fangs pierce into the plant, pierce into the stem of a um of a lily pad all right i don't know how many of you have played with lily pads but they are kind of hollow in the center right um they have that opening these weevils will actually pierce into these plants and breathe through them so they've got i when i was all right we can call them butt fangs yeah. When I was in when I was in college we called them we called them something things. Um and we thought it was really funny. But there are little spiracles, little holes at the end of these and they poke them into the plant and they have the ability to use the plant as um to use the plant as a snorkel and to just breathe through it, which is kind of a fun little story. When they pupate and become adults, they spend their time on top of the on top of the uh lily pad oh yes there is also a youtube video about these aquatic moths so you can go ahead and check that out on my channel thank you for calling that out chaos let's see there are diving bell spiders, which entirely, which entirely lives in the water and have webs that are hydrophobic. That's really cool. I definitely have a lot to learn when it comes to spiders. I haven't spent as much time reading about them, and I, the more that I hear about spiders, the more interesting and complex they become. Um, I love that they're partially hydraulic. Um, I hope you all know that. Awesome. Thank you, little B, for hanging out with us. I always have a great time chatting bugs with people. 
yes, silk works underwater. Silk is definitely magic. And um, moths and caterpillars will have different kind of strengths and different varieties of silk. So not all silk would probably work underwater, but these caterpillars do. And there are a variety of caddisflies that'll also make nets underwater out of their silk. Can you show the butterfly's abs again? I don't know where the butterfly has abs, but I can show you this. I mean, they have six legs, so I guess you could say they have a six pack. I do have mayfly specimens, yes. I have nymphs and adult mayflies. I also have nymph and adult damselflies. So when we do our jewel ring damselfly, we can also look at an immature man uh, at an immature damselfly. Um, I do plan on collecting myself a dragonfly specimen or two shortly. I finally found out where I can get them quickly and easily, so I'm going to go ahead and do that shortly. Guys, I love house centipedes too. But I don't want to sketch them because I love myself some legs, but I'm not about sketching, uh, sketching, what, 60? Probably a good 60 legs on one of those specimens. Not me. Oh, where do, um, where do our weevils live? Well... I've got this nifty book. It's the Aquatic Insects of North America by Rich Merritt, um, Ken Cummins, and Marty Berg. And if you're into aquatic insects, this is the book to have for North America. All right. It has beautiful sketched images. It has keys to everything. And it has distributions. Um, I was lucky enough to take a class from all three authors um, it was a 10 day, um, in, it was a 10 day lab at the, at a biological station and we got to collect and learn about all types of stuff. It was so much fun. So this book is actually signed by all three authors because <laughs> I'm a bug nerd. I'm looking up your distribution for those curculionids right now. I think that's it. Brachius. That sounds right. No. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this quickly. I bet, so I would have to look it up, so I'm not, I don't, I don't think I have time to look at the, up the answer to the question where they are, but I bet if you have lily pads, you have them. Um, one thing that you can look at, a sign that they are there, is if you're looking at the top of the lily pads, before you dive into the water, look at the top of the lily pads, and you want to see kind of little brown spots kind of all over them or in certain places, maybe even some areas where there are holes all the way through the leaf, that's going to show that the weevils, the adult weevils, have been feeding on the plant, and then you're likely to find the immature stage. So I can't tell you if you have them, but I know how to tell you to figure out yourself, right? So go out there and check to see if there are feeding, if something is feeding on those. Because if something is, it could be this weevil. Now there are a variety of other insects that are going to be feeding on these, but they're all... Um, it would be cool to find any of them, right? So go ahead and search. I do believe that there are also miners of, um, of lily pads. So you'll see like snake-like patterns in the green leaf. And that's because there's actually an insect living in between the, in between the layers of the leaf, kind of mining itself around. Wait, are we doing spiders at some point? Oh, man. 
man. I mean, we could do a class on spiders. I do have one spider specimen that is pinned well. So uh, we could. We could sketch a spider and talk about spiders once if we wanted. But damselflies damselflies is what's lo earned earned a place in my heart next week that's what we're gonna do we're gonna do damselfly adults and immatures next week all right bye marley thanks for hanging out oh the water is spiky All right, perfect. Um, we are about at 90 minutes. That's when I, I, I say everywhere, uh, you know, that the live streams are about an hour and a half. So we did it. We made it to our time. We got to talk about all types of things. You guys, I could talk about aquatic breathing systems. I kind of love them. I mean, we talked about, you also, somebody mentioned in the chat about damselflies because damselflies have tail-like gills is kind of cool rather than dragonflies who have anal gills so their gills are actually on the inside of their abdomen um you know all types of stuff insects come up with the coolest ways to breathe um butterflies they just have little spiracles and because there's so much hair on the sides of the abdomen you're never gonna see them but they've got spiracles that run along the sides of their abdomen that help them breathe all right um, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Give me a minute. Um, this one. Hello? Hello. Okay, you can hear me now, right? I've been having tr I I've been having problems with my audio today. I am so sorry about that. All right, do I have audio back? Okay, perfect. All right. I, um, I'm sorry about that. I just want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Um, it is you guys that help me, um, that help me figure out what we're talking about next, right? So right after we got done sketching our butterfly, it's, you know, those leading questions that lead us to talking about aquatics and talking about breathing underwater and damselflies and weevils and all these things that really make it interesting for both me and I believe you guys when you're out there asking questions and interacting with me. So I super, super appreciate it. You guys are what um, make this work. Um, and I love uh, experiencing my microscope not only alone, but with you guys out there in the world. So um, thank you for being here and asking questions and helping me out. Next week, we are going to be doing damselflies, adults and immatures. <clears throat> and we get to talk about their really cool labium that reaches out and grabs things. And if you don't know what, and if you don't know, you will know next week. Um... I teach classes for 5 to 8 year olds, 9 to 12 year olds, and I'm working on high school level classes for 13 to 16 that are kind of like college prep entomology classes. Um, so if you know a student who likes bugs or wants to chat bugs with me weekly, you can go over to OutSchool, find me um, at Trisha Nichols, and um, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. We are 
closing, we're at like 1300 or something. So we're closing it on 1500 and I'm pretty excited about that number. Um, and right about here, that is where you let me know that you had a wonderful time and you'd like to support me. Um, you can scan that QR code to donate a couple of dollars. Um, if you would like, obviously, um, you can buy me a coffee. Let me know you had a good time. Leave me a little note. I um, it's this is what I do. This is what I love, and anything that you can do is super appreciated because this is what um this is what helps me um continue to do this and continue to share insects with people I love. Um, I teach both in person and online. So out school is where I teach students. Um. Out school is where I teach students virtually, um, but I am also in person. I am in the Philadelphia region, so if you are within an hour or so of Philadelphia and you want me to come out to a party or an event or set up a table, I can come and talk about bugs. I can bring my microscope and sketch. I can um, bring live animals. I actually now have pet tarantulas and beetles and mil and and um and yeah, Scorpion. It's been a good time. I've been playing an uh, ant colony that I'm super proud of. <laughs> all right. So I teach all over the place. Oh, thank you. Um, and you guys, my fans there, you guys are what make this happen. So I super, super appreciate it. Um, now I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. I will be back here on Sunday at four, but if that time frame doesn't work for you, I will always be back here next Thursday at 10 PM. And guess what? Next Thursday is my birthday. It's my actual birthday and I'm going to be here spending my birthday night with you guys. I'm pretty stoked about it. All right. So I will see you all next week for our special birthday session. And we're doing damselflies. <laughs> all right, Susan, I hope you ans I answered all of your questions. If you do have any other further questions for me, you can find um, you can find a contact me section on my website at theinsectopia.com. Um, that'll help you get access to me, or you can just email me. Um, my email is trisha at theinsectopia.com. All right. Woohoo! Birthday bugs. All right. I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Ta-ta for now.